Well, Merry Christmas, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this time of worship with Forest Lake Baptist Church. I'm Donnie Payne, one of the pastors, and we just appreciate you being with us tonight. This is a little bit different. Usually we'd be in person for our Christmas Eve candlelight worship service, but of course we can't because of COVID and some other issues that are going on this year. Still, we're going to worship the Lord. And uh, if you receive uh, these two items when you're in worship, uh, this little outline and also the Lord's Supper um, in, that's encapsulated together. You can use those in the next few moments as we worship. But if you don't, just take a break, pause the video, go and get some bread and some juice and get ready to worship the Lord with us. God bless you and Merry Christmas. Good evening. We want to welcome you to our Christmas Eve service at Forest Lake Baptist Church this evening. We, of course, are coming to you virtually and we appreciate each of you participating with us in this service. During the Advent season, we light candles that remind us of hope, love, joy, and peace on the Sundays leading up to Christmas Day, or if we have a Christmas Eve service like this, Christmas Eve, in which we light the Christ candle. The scripture tells us that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And that as many as received Him, to them He gave right to become children of God, even to those who believe in His name. That word glory that is mentioned in verse 14 is a significant word. It reminds us of the outshining of his divine and eternal significance. Our prayer tonight, as we worship together on this Christmas Eve, is that Christ will shine in your hearts and in your lives as a result of the worship that we share and as we look to the one who is the Lord of life and light. Thank you for being with us. Well, thank you, Brother Rick. Good evening. Welcome to everyone. I, too, want to just extend a welcome and a thank you for gathering with us tonight in our Christmas Eve service. I know you guys probably have a lot of things going on with the family, and you're trying to get everything ready for Christmas morning, but we just want to say thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us and worship together with us. We're going to sing a couple Christmas songs together, so I know you guys are going to recognize these. So if you will, just in your home, just you and your family, lift these songs up and let's worship together. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. Joy to the world, the Savior reigns. Let all their songs employ, while fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy, repeat the sounding joy. Repeat, repeat the sounding joy. Joy, unspeakable joy, an overflowing well, no tongue can tell. Go. He rules the 
world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of His righteousness and wonders of His love and wonders of His love and wonders wonders of His love Joy unspeakable joy and overflowing well no tongue can tell Joy unspeakable joy it rises in my soul you're so thankful for that joy that only God can give that only comes from him amen Oh, hear the angel. 
Father, God, we just thank you and praise you for that night that you sent your Son here on this earth, Father, to be our Savior, our King, our Lord, and to ultimately pay the ultimate sacrifice with his life to pay our debt and to take our sins and our shame upon that cross. But not only did you die, Father, praise God, you rose from the grave on the third day, claiming victory over death, victory over the grave, victory over hell and sin. And Father, we thank you, and God, we praise you for that. So Father, I ask that you would just be with all those that are watching and listening tonight, Father. God, as it's just a a wonderful time for a lot, but some people, it's a hard and it's a tough time, Father, whether they've lost loved ones, or maybe their loved ones are serving in another country to protect our freedom for us. Father, whatever it may be, God, I just pray for them tonight. God, that you would comfort them. And God, that you would just bless us. And God, we thank you and we praise you. For it's in your precious name we pray. Amen. Your baby boy 
would calm the storm with his hand. Did you know that your baby boy has walked where angels tried? And when you kiss your little baby, you've kissed the face of God. The blind will see, the deaf will hear, the dead will live again. The lame will leap, the dumb will speak, the praises of the Lamb. Mary, did you know that your baby boy is Lord of all creation? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day rule the nations? Did you know that your baby boy is heaven's perfect lamb? This sleeping child you're holding is a great Thanks, Brad. I feel like I could just say amen and we could close it up for the night. Well, good evening, church. Thank you for tuning in online for our virtual Christmas Eve service. Uh, my name is Patrick. I have the blessing of serving as one of the, the pastors here at Forest Lake. And man, it just kills me that we can't gather together as, as one faith family in this room tonight, but praise God for the gift of technology that allows us to still be able to, to worship and celebrate the name of Jesus together, even if we are spread out on, on different couches and different living rooms uh, and different homes around the state, maybe even the country. So uh, eight years ago, on November 17th, had to look at my notes, make sure I get it right, 2012, my wife Jacqueline and I, we got married. Uh, and on that day, she, she placed uh, this, this ring right here, this wedding ring, on my hand. And it's really not an expensive ring. In fact, when we got married, we were making maybe 48 bucks a month. So it's really not an expensive ring at all. We just went and bought the most expensive, the most expensive looking rings we could get that, that were actually the cheapest that we could afford. And so sometimes you got to fake it until you make it. All right. So every, every morning, I slide this ring onto my, on my finger. If you found it, it probably wouldn't mean much to you. It probably wouldn't have any significance in your life. Probably wouldn't be worth much to you at all. Wouldn't really have any, any value for you at all. But, but man, for me, it represents some significant realities, some significant promises. Like even though we've only been married eight years, it still blows my mind that my wife Jacqueline, despite knowing all my failures, all my shortcomings, despite knowing that, that I'm kind of OCD when it comes to how my chicken's cooked, or despite that, that, I, that I sometimes get a little weird and quirky about some stuff that makes really no sense at all, despite the fact that I'm a, I'm a miserable gift giver, especially at Christmas, God help me, despite the fact that it took five years for her to train me to put the seat down when I use the bathroom, despite all that, she still looked me dead in the eye in front of God and family and friends and said, I'm in. I'm going all in here, and so every time my ring clinks on a, on a coffee cup, or every time I, I slide it off to go run, or every time I, I, I get out of the shower, every time I slide it on in the morning, it, it just reminds me of these significant realities. Now, let me be straight with you. I don't love the ring. I try, it's, it's not the ring that I love. The ring doesn't have my affections. It doesn't make, make me feel any kind of certain way. The ring doesn't make me married. So, so if I take it off, I'm still married. I'm not Frodo. This isn't Lord of the Rings. If I take it off, I'm still married. It doesn't make me married. But in the end, despite the fact that it's not the ring that I love, the ring does represent 
who I do love. Right? Like the ring does represent who, who has my affections. It, it is a picture of some significant reality, some weighty promises. It's not the reality themselves, but it is a picture of those realities. Or, or as the book of Colossians would put it, the ring is a shadow of the substance of my love and affection for my wife. It's a, it's a shadow of our marriage, but it's not our marriage, right? So this ring points outside of itself to, to bigger, greater, weightier realities. And so listen, man, for all the fun and excitement of the Christmas season, and, and it's fun and exciting, especially if you have little kids, right? I mean, my, my cards are on the table. I love Christmas. So I'm all in on Christmas. Our tree is up. Our halls are decked with stockings that have been hung with care. We're blaring music from the time that we get home from work until the time we lay our kids down for bed. I'm all in on tinsels and trees and cards and carols. I'm all in on on everything that that really surrounds this Christmas season, trees and gifts and presents and hot chocolate. And just last night, man, I'm, I'm cozied up in this warm felt blanket, got a cup of hot chocolate watching Mulan on Disney Plus. So I'm I'm all in on that. And yet, what I want to lay before you this evening is that in the end, this season, Advent, is like my wedding ring. And here's what I mean by that. For, for all, all the fun and excitement and really happiness and, and for, in some sense, joy that this season brings to so many of us, this season, in the end, is not where our hope lies. Right? Our hope ultimately is not in Advent, but rather in, in the thing to which Advent points, the person to which Advent points. See, like my wedding ring represents my marriage, but it's not my marriage. It's just a shadow of my marriage, but it's not my marriage. This season, for all the good and fun and excitement, is just a shadow of a much greater, weightier, deeper, eternal reality. So what I want us to do for the next few moments is just think about, okay, what is that reality? What is it that the Scriptures tell us this season points to? What is, what is it that the Scriptures teach us that in the end, this season ultimately is about? That in the end, this season ultimately is, is pointing to? What is it that, that we're still going to be celebrating and leaning into for hope and joy and peace when the lights have been taken down, the leftovers are gone, and you've returned that gift you got from your second cousin? So here's, here's the truth that, that represents what Advent is, is pointing to, where our hope ultimately lies as we think about this season. At Christmas, we celebrate Jesus' first advent, and we anticipate his second advent. At Christmas, we celebrate Jesus' first coming, and then we anticipate his second coming. So Christmas, in the end, is about celebration, and it's about anticipation. We celebrate Jesus' first coming, his first advent, and we anticipate his second coming, his second advent. Let me show you this. If you have your Bible, go ahead and grab it, Hebrews chapter 9. Just going to look at three quick verses here in Hebrews chapter 9. We're going to start in verse 26 and read through verse 28. Hebrews 9, 26 says this. But now Christ has appeared one time at the end of the ages for the removal of sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for people to die once and after this judgment... So also Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. So here's what this text teaches us about what's ultimate at Christmas. What's, What's the substance to which this season points? First truth, at Christmas we, we celebrate Jesus' first advent. Right, so one of the things this season is pointing to is Jesus' first coming. This really is the, is, is the heart of this, this season all together. And there are two things 
that, that we get from this text that we're celebrating about Jesus' first coming. Here's the first one. We celebrate that Jesus came to live a sinless life. Jesus came to live a sinless life. That's verse 26 where the writer of Hebrews just tells us this. Christ appeared once at the end of the ages for the removal of sin. Underline that in your Bible if you, if you do that, for the removal of sin. And then he, he repeats this in verse 28 when he says, Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. Now, now how does he do that? How does Christ bear the sins of many? How does he remove sin? Well, first, by living a sinless life, by living a totally perfect, completely obedient, fully righteous life, the kind of life that you and I could never live because we're not sinless, right? We're woefully sinful. We show up that way. If you don't believe me, just get around kids. So, so when we think about Advent, we celebrate first the fact that the God of the universe took on flesh and came to live a perfect, sinless, totally righteous life. We also celebrate the fact that Jesus came to die a substitutionary death, a death in our place. That's the second part of verse 26, where where the writer says, Christ came for the removal of sin by the sacrifice of himself. Now, maybe you're not a Christian. Maybe you don't know this passage. Maybe you're kind of new to this whole sacrifice, death. What is all this about? How does, how does this sacrifice work? What's, what's going on here? Well, we believe from the Scriptures that God is, is two things at least. He's perfectly, completely holy. So he's perfectly, perfectly, completely separate, other than, above, blameless. And we believe that he's perfectly, completely just. That he always does what is just and right and good and never does what isn't. So, so perfectly holy and perfectly, completely just. Now, that means two things for you and me. Because God has always been holy, always will be holy, it means that he cannot tolerate or be in the presence of sinners. That's Psalm 5. And because God has always been and will always be perfectly just, it means that he must punish sinners like you and me. And Paul tells us in in Romans 6 that the wages of of sin, the punishment that we deserve is death. Now, if you're starting to put the pieces together here, you're you're probably going, "Uh uh-oh, uh-oh. I mean, if it's true that God is holy, and he is, and that he can't be in the presence of sinners, but I'm a sinner, and and you're a sinner, and and if you're going, okay, but he's also just, and that means that he must punish sinners, but but I'm a sinner, and, and you're a sinner, that, that's not good news. Not only does it mean that we can't be in his presence, but it also means that we deserve eternal punishment, or what the Bible would call wrath. Do sinners like us. And that punishment is death. As sinners, we deserve to die. Merry Christmas. So, so as sinners, we deserve death unless. And now it's getting good. Now we're getting the gospel. Unless... Someone who isn't a sinner, someone who's totally, perfectly, completely righteous, willingly dies in our place instead. Enter Jesus Christ. Praise Christ that he not only came to live a sinless, perfectly righteous life that that we could never live, but, but that he also died willingly in our place, the death that we deserve to die. He sacrificed himself in our place so that we might draw near to the Lord and be declared holy, righteous, innocent before him. So at Christmas, we not only celebrate the crib, we also celebrate the cross. We celebrate the the fact that God took on flesh and came to live a life we could never live, die a death that we deserve to die, and rise from the dead three days later to conquer sin, death, and hell forever. So that if we'll put our faith in him, we might be declared blameless before him and enter into his presence forevermore. So at Christmas, we've said we celebrate. We celebrate Jesus' first advent, his first coming, but we also anticipate. We anticipate his, his second advent, his second coming. That's verse 28, where the writer says, Christ 
having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time. And when he does, he won't, he won't bear sin, but he'll bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. So here's what this text just said. Now look right at me. You've got to hear this. Jesus is coming again. Do you hear me? He's coming back. And that's amazing, wonderful, incredible news. It's the kind of news that really should evoke two different responses from two different groups of people, right? So, so for, for believers who have put their faith in Christ, who, who are pursuing after the Lord with, with diligence, this should make your heart launch out of your chest and worship. Because it means there's coming a day when, hear this, Christ will come a second time to rescue those who have trusted in him. It's coming a day, church, when Christ will come to rescue, redeem, set right all that's broken in the world. And listen, you don't have to look very far in 2020 to see that this world is broken. It, it's, it's busted up. It's not what it's supposed to be. And what the scriptures are teaching here is that at Christmas we're anticipating the day when Christ returns for his bride. And there's no more crying, no more mourning, no more pain, no more cancer, no more coronavirus, no more, no more divorce, no more disease, no more, no more death, no more political corruption, no more social injustice, no more. And, and so in, in the end, we're celebrating the fact that there's coming a day when there's, there's no more crying or mourning or pain or death. There's immovable, inconquer, unconquerable, unending, everlasting joy and peace and life in the presence of Jesus himself. And as believers, we anticipate that day at Christmas. We anticipate the day when he's going to return a second time to set right all that's gone wrong with the world. But for unbelievers, the truth that Christ is coming again, it shouldn't evoke a kind of celebration in you. It should, if you're paying attention, evoke a kind of holy fear of what that day will be like. Because for unbelievers, this text tells us that Christ's second advent will be one of judgment. He'll come to judge those who have turned from him. For those who have have rejected his wooing, for those who have said, I don't don't need you, God. I've got got money. I've got a career. I've got relationships. I've got influence. I've got got a good resume. I've got a happy life, big house, nice car. I I don't need you. This text tells us that in his second advent, those who are outside of the family of God, those who have not put their faith in Christ, will be met with with judgment, with eternal condemnation, eternal separation from God, who alone can bring peace, who alone can bring joy, who alone can bring life. And I don't know about you, but but I'm, I'm hungry for some joy and peace and satisfaction in 2020. So here's the invitation I want to lay before you as we close. So if you're tuning in and you're a believer, you would say, man, I'm all in on G. I'm a follower of Christ. I'm in the Word daily. I'm praying. I'm sharing my faith with other people. Let's celebrate, man. Let's celebrate. Yes, let's celebrate lights and and trees and hot chocolate and Hallmark movies. and Let's celebrate. But in the end, let's remember that this season is ultimately just a shadow that points to what we ultimately celebrate in this season. And when we ultimately celebrate at Christmas, in the end, what's at the bottom of our celebration, of our, of our joy, of our excitement is the truth. That in his first coming, Christ lived a sinless life and died a death on our behalf so that we might, might know him and enjoy him and dwell with him and live with him until he comes again. And if you're tuning in, you'd say, if I'm honest, Patrick, I don't, I don't really know this, this Jesus you're talking about. I'm not really a, a Christ Father, I'm not a Christian. I don't really buy into all that. It kind of seems kind of goofy and weird and silly to me. I just want to ask you, we've laid on the table that, that the offer given to us at Advent through Christ's life, death, and resurrection is eternal peace and eternal joy and eternal life and eternal hope in the presence of God Almighty. Now, I don't know who, who's watching, but here's what I do know. You're serious about your joy 
and you're serious about having your desires satisfied, you're serious about finding peace and hope. And so I just want to ask you, what are you waiting for? Like, like what is it that's holding you back from going all in, from putting your faith in the only person, God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, who can offer you peace and hope and joy and life and eternal satisfaction, eternal pleasure, eternal hope and joy forevermore. Like, what is it that's holding you back from finding eternal hope and life and the God of the universe? So here's the invitation I want to I wanna lay before you as we, as we close. If, if, you're, if you're not a Christ follower and, and you're, you're kind of curious about this, you, you, there's a nagging in your, in your heart, in your, in your gut, you kind of know some, somebody's pulling, somebody's wooing, something's happening here, I just want to ask you, man, will you stop, will you stop drinking from wells that can't satisfy? Man, that promotion is fun for, for a little bit, but then it's going to fizzle out. The bank account's fat for a while, but you can't take it with you. You're going to get a, ma- a new phone, new Xbox, new, new whatever at Christmas, and it's going to be fun for six months, a year, two years. And then there's going to be another one. And you're going to feel like, I need, I need that one. So will you stop drinking from those wells that won't satisfy? And in the end, will you drink from the well that never runs dry and will always satisfy? Will you put your faith tonight, right now, in Jesus Christ? In a second, uh, Rick's going to come and lead us in communion. And if you've made the decision right now, that, man, I'm all, I want to put my faith in Christ. I want to know this God you're talking about. And I just want to invite you, as you're gathered with your family or friends or just sitting there on the couch by yourself, would you, would you get some, some bread and, and grape juice or whatever you've got to do and just take this with us? We want to welcome you into the family of God. As believers, we celebrate Christ's first coming and anticipate his second coming, and we want you to be a part of that faith family. We want you to put your faith in Christ, that you might join us in celebrating Christ coming this season as we look forward to his second coming one day very soon. Let me pray for us as we close. Father, we thank you for the amazing, exciting, astounding truth that you came, took on flesh, dwelt among us, Emmanuel, and you lived a sinless life and died a death on our behalf, that we deserve to die. And then three days later, you rose from the grave conquering sin and, and death and Satan. And we celebrate your first coming and we anticipate your second coming. We anticipate seeing you face to face. Help us to remember that, that, that that's what's at the bottom of this season. That's, what our, that's where our hope ultimately needs to lie. That's what ultimately gives us joy and peace and hope. For those who don't know you, I pray that you would open their hearts and minds to see you, to see their need for you, to see the hope and, and joy and peace and life that's found in you, and that they might know tonight what it means to join the family of faith who has our hope anchored and your life, death, and resurrection, and who look forward to the day when you come again to set right all that's broken. We love you. We need you. Thank you for sending your son. We look forward to the day when we'll see it face to face. And it's in your name we ask all these things. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Tonight as we close, I want to invite you to share in the communion cup with us. Now you're in your home and you may use the cups such as we use at Forest Lake Baptist Church. We've made those available to our church family in recent weeks. Or you may use juice out of your refrigerator from a half-gallon jug and a Ritz cracker. It's not the cracker. It's the intent. And so we're going to share in that, and we want to do that as we close, and we want to invite you to participate. The Apostle Paul spoke of the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper, as we call it, as Jesus had revealed it to him. Now, you'll recall, of course, that Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, he gathered with his disciples in an upper room, and he shared a meal with them, and he talked with them about his death. And not long after that, Judas went out and betrayed him. And so that tradition 
of observing what we now call the communion cup has been passed down to us. And when Paul speaks to us about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he is reminding the church of the very message that Patrick has just brought to us, that Jesus came and he died, and that one day he will return again. And so as we do this, I want to just remind you that the wafer represents Jesus' body and the juice represents his blood. The Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had broken it, he passed it to his disciples. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. We're reminded that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. After the supper, or after the passing of the bread, the Lord Jesus passed the wine, and he said to his disciples, This is my blood, which is shed for you. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And then he said to the disciples, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. As we worship him in the Christmas season, we celebrate that first advent. We look forward to the second advent. And we look forward in that day, to that day, anticipating that we will be removed from this life and place of sin and we'll dwell with him in eternal glory. The outshining of Jesus' divine significance is represented by the lights of Christmas. And our wish for you is that the light of the life of Christ will shine into your hearts and that you will have a very Merry Christmas. And so we wish you Merry Christmas from the Forest Lake Baptist Church family and we trust that the Lord will speak to you and bless you with his peace and his joy. Let's pray. Father, tonight we thank you for the music that we have heard, for the message that has challenged our hearts, for the call to follow Christ that has been articulated so clearly. As we observe the communion cup, we are reminded of your literal body and of your blood that was shed on this earth. Let us Receive this with deep gratitude, knowing that by receiving it, we are confessing to those around us that we have trusted in you. And as we trust you in this Christmas season, may the light of the Lord Jesus Christ shine in our hearts and through our lives so that others know that you're real, God of the universe, King of heaven, Lord of lords, and the one who is the focus of Christmas. God bless you all. Merry Christmas.